One of the things that you and I believe in is the power of putting the right people around you. Absolutely. And in fact, we had this conversation with Jonathan Weiner where he talks about put the right people around you and let them profit, right? So bring the right team around, make sure they have everything they need to be successful, and then share with all of them. And one of the things that you and I have, have believed for ent our entire careers is the value of, of, of hiring amazing people, of partnering with one another who have very complementary, complementary skill sets. But there is this theme that comes across on every single one of the Big Shot interviews where they talk about how they did a lot, but the people around them did even more. And, and, and they're all humble and modest enough to say, I had the greatest team around me. And when you think about it, these companies, whether it's the Expos or it's Four Seasons or it's Candorel or it's Aldo or, or Rio Can, yes, we interviewed the founders, but the founders themselves believe that the people they put around them, their teams, was part of the magic that made these companies what they were. And, and it and wasn't just them. It's also such a great source of pride for them. When you give people creative freedom and you let them spread their wings and fly, around you, great things happen. And then share with them. And share with them. And you pay it forward and everybody benefits. And, and that's one of actually the most beautiful things yeah. about building a business. Yeah. Is now, the impact it has, not just for your own self, or your family, but all the other families around you that participate in you and the people and how they grow and develop and, and profit. But isn't that the well. best part of entrepreneurship? That Absolutely. Like, entrepreneurship is you, you start this, this thing, you start this train and yeah. you get it going and eventually this, the train starts to move and then along the way, you pick up wonderful passengers yeah. and partners to add to this incredible mission yeah. and then eventually- And watch them self-actualize. And, and watch them grow into right. their full potential and right. then you share with them. So we're gonna do a Big Shot Short talking about the value of team building and, and why bringing the right people on is so important and then sharing with them is so important. So let's hear from a few of our Big Shots in terms of how they think about building a world-class team and making sure that team stays with them for a long time and keeps requalifying. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we here. Started from the bottom, now my whole team in. Started from the bottom, now we here. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. I didn't keep it real from the jump. Living at my mama house, we'd argue every month. I was, I was trying to get it. One common theme here that we're talking about is that whether it's Leo or it's some of the folks with uh, around the Expos or even Birthright, your partner, Michael, you tend to bet on people. And I'm curious the types of people you bet on. I mean, you knew Leo when you were both at McGill University, you were first year, he was in law school. Um, Michael, obviously with Birthright, of course, but talk a bit about the types of partnerships that you've been through in your life, because whether it's Birthright, Cadillac, yeah. Fairview, the Montreal Expos, Major League Baseball, philanthropy, there is a, there's something to the people you work with that are quite exceptional. Well, in the first place, I am not a loner. I don't do well by myself. Now. Even the sports, for instance, I was a reasonable tennis player, but only in doubles. <laughs> in singles, there'd be people who I could wipe the floor with who would beat me mm -hmm. because I, I was unsure of myself. But if I had a partner, I knew that partner, I didn't have to depend only on myself. Right. I had somebody to fall back on. And that was true in, in business also, and in philanthropy. Uh, I like to have people who have the skill sets I don't have, and I have the skill sets they don't have. That's a partnership, yeah. and, and it works. Yeah. And I don't like change. I think once you have the chemistry with somebody, uh, you keep that chemistry, for instance, John McHale was our president of the Expos. Maybe he shouldn't have been all the time, but he was, because I didn't want to change. Uh, Jeff Solomon, who is regarded as the number one uh, uh, CEO right. of philanthropy in the United States, Jeff's been with me for 25 years. My assistant's been with me for over 20 years. Wow. But yet you're not afraid to make the changes and the chemistry is not there. Gary Carter, who is the you know, well-known hero of the Mets when he won the World Series, I mean, you, you traded him from the Expos and, and I believe the line is, the only no trade, chemistry. It's the only trade I made. Yeah. But he was an amazing ball player and he still he traded was, him. He was for the Mets. Not for the Expos. Didn't as, have I, as I said, 
we can lose as well with Carter as without Carter. So I, there was a new hotel opened in Toronto. I think it might have been the, called the Westbury. And it was the new hotel. So I went and spoke to the general manager of that hotel. And I said, look, I'm building something here. I'm not coming to you to see whether you'd like to you know, join me. But do you know anybody I might speak to in the hotel business to hire as a general manager? And he said, yeah, I've got a friend who just came over from England and he's running this little place and you might talk to him. So I did. And when I went in and met this man, his name was Ian Monroe, and he was dressed in a very formal, almost like a morning suit, like he was going to a wedding or something. So I talked to him what I'm intending to do. Would you think you'd like to maybe run this hotel for us? And he gave me his list of things he had done. And we had a nice, charming conversation. So I hired him. Now, I don't know how to interview people and how to hire people. You know, I'm still... You're a construction yeah. guy. Yeah, I'm a construction guy, 25 years old. And he seemed like a nice guy. Yeah. Well-dressed. Never, never, exactly. Yeah. He made some jokes and talked about what he did before. And I said, okay, but I have one condition. I never want to see you wear that suit in the hotel. <laughs> I'm thinking of a Not place... Not the vibe that, you were going for, eh? <laughs> I'm thinking of a place that we welcome people, feeling casual, and... So we joined forces and became very good friends, and he taught me the hotel business. Wow. He was gregarious. He knew food and beverage. He was charming, and he understood. I said, Ian, I want to make sure that whoever comes in that, comes in that door... They're a guest. I don't want to judge people by what they wear and who they are. If they're willing to walk in and want a room, hey, unless you know the guy is a criminal or something. So he understood. I said, they're our guests and treat them as we are the host. So he understood me trying to articulate what Four Seasons has become. Wow. But he understood it because he was that kind of person. Right. Charming, able to. So he hired the people with that basic principle of we treat everybody with respect, welcome them, and that became the beginning. So that, that DNA of Ian is his name, his name? Ian Monroe. Ian Monroe. So is it safe to say that the Ian Monroe sort of DNA, that Ian Monroe thoughtfulness about hospitality, food and beverage, uh, welcoming people in an, in an incredibly kind way. Is that the blueprint for effectively hospitality? Or the golden uh, rule. Or the, is, is that the blueprint for the golden rule? That's not what caused or became the golden rule, but right. just the principle of treating people as you would if you're having a guest to your home. Right. You know, you welcome them, you want to make sure they're having a good evening. So his expertise was food. He really was a foodie, big, staunch. He looked like him. He liked food like, as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that was the, the beginning without being able to articulate what we wanted to become. Because remember, I was not thinking of going into the hotel business. Right, right. this is real it estate. still a real estate deal. Yeah. I would sell it. Luckily and fortunately, it became very successful out of the gate. So I could pay back all the people I had promised. And again, it's not a, you know, if it doesn't work, we're You're cooked. throwing the keys. Yeah. It was a phenomenal success because of Peter Dickinson's architecture. The design was so yeah. magnificent. It was dramatic. I mean, you could not want to yeah. go in. You, if you drove by, you say, I, we got to go we look. We got to see what that is. Yeah. But and and, and there's, nothing, there's nothing else like it anywhere. Nothing. Right. It it was when I look at it now, like the photograph sure. of it, I say, How in the world did I do that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but you, then you tell an architect you need something that's gonna bring people to you. Right. It's like a you, magnet, yeah. Well, you guys have done the same. If you think if you hire the right talent yeah. and you and you give them the freedom to 
express what their town is all about, they, they do things out of the box. Okay. Yeah. So Peter Dickinson's design was a magnet. And Ian Monroe, in managing as a host, did spectacular things in terms of the guest experience. When did customer service and when did that feeling of hospitality become such a cornerstone of the Four Seasons brand? That took time uh, to, uh, not to envision, but to create. Um, because as I say, we started with this hospitality host concept, and that's really what differentiated us in England and what I knew made us a success. Because in England at that time, if you went into the Dorchester, the Connaught, Claridge's, if you weren't dressed properly, you couldn't even come into the hotel. Yeah, black t-shirt wouldn't work there. That's right. <laughs> and they looked down upon you. Ah, you know, you were checking the front desk, they would look up and say, yes, we might have a room for that. Attitude was very much social class. There were, what? Those Europe at that time, there right. was a social sure. class. So our hotel was very different. London, we hired the people and told them this is not how we judge others. Uh, it's not, we're not the Dorchester, we're not Claridge's, we are the Inn on the Park. And so London was a rep repeat, repeat of the other hotels. Ian Monroe, again, he wasn't going to run London because he was already running the other two hotels, but he hired people and explained, look, this is how we operate. We're not, you know, judging people, and we treat everybody the same. It's not whether he's an important person or a worker. Everybody who is coming into the hotel or who works in the hotel, there's an egalitarian, equal approach to attitude about people. So London became the best hotel, and I knew why. Because we didn't build a grand hotel. I mean, when you went into these other hotels, yeah, the they, were, or the they were palaces. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. So we were in a modern, you know, building. Nothing impressive compared to them. But our people, the service, changed how people were treated in London. But you also took care of your own people. One thing that really stuck out for me is that uh, Four Seasons employees are allowed to stay for free at the hotels, which is... Quite unique. That's I totally new. We, we, when we yeah. did our research on this, no other right? hotel does right. that. But th those things happened over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. How you create, you know, the benefit. How do you help get people to respond to what you're talking about? What you're talking about, the service aspect. So that happened over many years. Mm -hmm. So, but London made it clear to me that service and attitude was the key for four seasons. So when I hired my first employee, yeah. I would say, listen, uh, Robert, there was Robert, there was Serge, there was, uh, you know, yeah. and I would say to them, I don't want you to lie to me. If one day you don't want to work, you know, or you sick, or you want to help your wife? Just tell me. Just tell me yeah. about it, and you know, and and let's work, let's do well, let's you know, and basically explain to them, you know, our value of love, respect, and integrity. But at the same time, you also were very ambitious. Like you wanted to have a company that did good, that was socially responsible, that was thoughtful, mm -hmm. that had love. But you were also incredibly ambitious. I mean. The vertical integration, being able to basically design your own shoes, manufacture your own shoes, and then get it right to the hands of the end consumer. And, and control the brand. And control and, the entire brand. That was a very novel thing to do. I mean, very few companies did that. So the, the, the juxtaposition is on one side, you're so ambitious, but on the other side, you want to build a different type of company. Exactly. And, and, it's more humane. And, and, and exactly. what, what I love about that is exactly. there's an integrity piece of it. I mean, you were angry at your former employer, and so that gave you, it sounds like it gave you energy to make sure exactly. you could do it better. Exactly, it's all the energy that I had because I wanted to prove to them and, you know, that I could do it. Plus, I wanted, you know, to make sure that we could help you know, 
everybody and that everybody that would be with us would reach their full potential. In other words, you know, my goal was yes, I want to make money, but at the same time, I want to help society. I want to help, you know, the community. Right. And I want to make sure that in the world, as I'm growing, those value of love, respect, and integrity, I carry, you know, in many different countries. In our office, right from the beginning, because yeah. of the type of company that I wanted to create, you know, was that love, respect, integrity, there was a lot of diversity. There was a lot of people, you know, from all kind of different country that would come, you know, different colors, different country, different religion. And those people, some of them came from United States, some from China, some from Mexico, some from wherever it is, you know, Europe. And that diversity helped me and our management team understand that if those people that are creating our shoes and building and, and designing our yeah. shoes and working with our footwear, why can they do the same thing, you know, in their own country? Right. They were visiting them and, you know, so, so to me, I think, you know, that yes, there is diversity in the world, but there is like a common thread of, you know, that certain thing, you know, a good, you know, like a winner, in New York is a winner in Montreal, is a right. winner in Tel Aviv, you know. I see it in my my speech at uh, graduation. First and foremost, be passionate about what you're doing. Don't worry so much about the money. The money will follow if you're really truly passionate about it. And if it doesn't, you'll find something else but be really passionate about what you're doing so that it's not going to work, it's going to play. You know, my kids said, Dad, at 60, when are you gonna retire? I said, I did 20 years ago. They said, what are you talking about? You still work like a dog. I said, I played like a dog. Because for me, every day was a joy and still is a joy. Even though I'm removed from CEO, I'm now COO. You know what COO is? Chief Opinion Officer. <laughs> sure, CEO loves that. <laughs> but. I love the business and so because and I love business not just my real estate business right. I love business and many different things that we've done and I love watching other people's success and making them successful if I can so first passion second put the right people around you and share with them let them become wealthy with you when I I built my company giving 20%, not of the company, but 20% of the action in the buildings and the real estate deals, deal by deal, 10% to head office and 10% to the field office. So each city was a field office, 10% went to that city and 10% went to the head office guys who supported them. And so I, different than the Reisman formula, I lent the employees the money to be able to invest because it was way beyond anybody's. And telling them to invest otherwise would be impossible. Right. So it'd be moot. Now, there are a few guys, yeah. two or three, that have done so exceptionally well that they write their own checks right. today mm -hmm. because there's an 8% premium on the money that I'm putting sure. in when they can borrow with 2% or 3%. Right. I don't want them to take my money. Right. I'm availing them of that. Since I removed myself as CEO, I moved that to 35%. 35% instead of 20% of the deal goes to the employees. Wow. And so my second comment to you in terms of the advice for your time capsule is right. I have people who've been with me 40 years. I have people with me 35 years. I have people with me 34. I have young people who would normally be gone in a year or two who are there 10 and 15 years. The office is a place where you create a culture. And as everybody at home, I think it's exceptionally hard. You can operate a company, but I don't think you can build a culture. Yeah. You build a culture by walking down the hall, putting your arm around somebody and saying, great, great job, or how can I help you get this across the finish line? You don't do that on a Zoom call or a phone call. Actually, I agree with you on that. Okay. 
And I don't know how you value it, but I think the pendulum is swinging. It swung all the way to the left in terms of the usefulness of office. I think those people who are buying office assets today are going to look brilliant five years from now when the pendulum swings back to the middle. Okay. So invest in your employees, invest in the organization and make them create a family, create, you know, I can tell you, I invited all my employees up to my country home every year for a, an extravagant dinner and a wild day in the country. We did crazy things, dragon boating, sand sculptures, all kinds of stuff that was team building oriented. My wife used to say, God, when are you going to stop this? I said, I'm never going to stop it because it's part of the employee's understanding that I care. Yeah. So invest in your employees in every way that you reasonably can to build your business. Great and the next piece is give it back, pay it forward. There are so many ways to do it. Get your employees to get involved. The defeat, the strength of the defeat is it's ours. It's not we're working for the Children's Hospital or the Jewish General Hospital right. or Centrade or Jewish Community this or that. This belongs to us. Started from the bottom, not a whole team. Yeah, I didn't keep it real from the jump. Living at my mama's house, we'd argue every month. I was, I was trying to get it on my own.